Gus, what's one thing from your dad's era that was innovative at the time, but today has changed dramatically? I know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I guess the the high elbow in relation to sprinting because the high elbow had driven like that beautiful Popov Gustavo stroke. Welcome back to another episode of the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist, joined by a really full crew today, Luke Paddington, Dr. John Mullen, and from different areas of the world, we've got a royal family in Brazilian swimming and world swimming, the great Gustavo Borges joining us from Brazil, and Gus Borges in snowy Ann Arbor. What's up, guys? Thanks for being on. We got to do this. All right. Look at that. that. Look, thank you. You got to do that. Wrap it. <laughs> what, you, what you got there, Luke? Uh, the Brazil team um, shirt from Rio in the Olympics. It was cool, man. Yeah. That's oh, where man. I saw you walk on deck, Gustavo, and the stadium erupted. They just announced that you were there, and it was more deafening than Tiago in the final. It was incredible. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's crazy, guys. So, what's going on this time of year? It's car- carnival usually happening, right? But no, no go this year. It got canceled. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, Carnival is always canceled for me. It's just more of an extended vacation, you know, a couple of days. No, nothing crazy for me, but uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Luke, Brian, Dr. John, and Gus, my son. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys, talking about swimming, talking about uh, whatever it is that we're going to discuss here. And um, I'm here in hot Brazil. It's about uh, 35 degrees Celsius, so you guys should be jealous right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, some of you guys are in California, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So California has a nice weather. But it's cold right now. So pleasure to be here. Yeah. It's cold here right now. It's probably like sub 30 Fahrenheit. So <laughs> opposite side of the spectrum. But yeah, thank you guys for having us. And I'm really excited to talk well, to you guys today. Well, let's let's talk some about that, though. So that's that's such a huge culture shock, right? And, and, and climate shock, too, to find your way to, to Michigan. And I feel like, Gus, you, of course knew through other experiences of your dad what that was going to be like uh before going but gustavo what was what was that like talk, talk to us about the i mean the the consideration of schools and how you ended up at michigan and what it was like getting there yeah and just for clarification you're gonna refer to me as gus and my dad as gustavo is that how yeah does that work dad and junior i don't care what how do you know no junior <laughs> gus and gustavo, let's go with that let's go with gus. yeah i'm go with that um yeah so basically it wasn't really a culture shock because i grew up just hearing about college from both my parents uh, my dad's from michigan and my mom's from florida and just a family of swimmers i knew that one day i was going to go to school in, in, in the united states i didn't know where exactly but i grew up hearing about the stories from michigan the stories from florida from my mom but mostly the ones from michigan and when i started visiting schools and I started looking for for different places. Um, that's when my dad kind of gave a step back and was like, hey, like, go go wherever you want to visit. You can visit anywhere except Ohio State. And I was like, OK, <laughs> that makes sense. And um, but, but Michigan was the only Big Ten school I visited. And I visited a couple other schools. And that's when my dad kind of like he was like, hey, like you just see where you love the most and you make that the decision based on what's best for you. Um, and at, at, at the end of the day, it became Michigan. And I had no doubt in my in my in my heart that it was the right place for me. And then my dad showed his emotions like, wow, I'm really happy that you chose Michigan. I think I also think it's a great fit. And it, it kind of just like worked out that way. And I'm really glad it did. But um, there, there was a little bit of influence, but it wasn't like you have to go to Michigan. It was more like kind of see what's out there. And Michigan ended up being the perfect place for me, which is which is awesome. I found it quite difficult to move from Trinidad to Montreal. I never saw snow before. Um, the language, um, the culture was so different. Um, they didn't understand me at all. And I spoke English. Um, and and the environment was tough for me in my first six months, um, for sure. Uh, Gustavo, perhaps you, how, how were you when you adapted to there? I mean, I know Mike Bottom is so welcoming, Gus, right? He's, he, he's, he's a, like a father figure welcoming. Did you have that, Gustavo? Did you get welcomed to the family there and you felt no issues or do you have a cultural shock as well uh for for me it was very different in my beginning coming to the us than than it was for gus because uh you think about 1990 1991 that's uh when i came to the us 1990 91 that's the season 
I had already graduated in high school, so I was, I was a post-grad. In Brazil, you graduate very early at age 17. So I turned 18 on my extra year in the US, in the US in, at a ball school. And it was a huge culture shock. I, mean, I didn't know anything English. I couldn't finish a book. I could, the only thing that I understood in, in high school was math because of numbers. And uh, it was, you know, you guys know Bowles is a, is a, it's a high school, it's a boarding school. So it was kind of facilitated a few things of being in one location and everything else. Had no idea what the pro process, had no idea that I had to get grades. My SAT was like horrible. I didn't even know what SAT was. I said, no, you need that for college. All right, so let's do that. I did my mm -hmm. SAT in the first two weeks I was in the US. Same for me. And I was going C, 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 C. And, uh, <laughs> and after a while, I started realizing how the process was. And I started getting um, uh, recruited by all the colleges. And John was a great recruiter, John Urbanchek. You guys know John. He's Great guy, great recruiter. I had a, a connection with Michigan because my sister lived there. She lived uh, for three months with a Michigan alumni called Charlie Moss. Mm -hmm. That swim also in Michigan, uh, a swimmer alumni. And there was a good connection. And when I visited Michigan, it was uh, late October. I think it was Thanksgiving. No, not Thanksgiving. Like October, late October or something like that. And I remember that was the first time I saw uh, snow. Late October, snowing in Michigan, and John looks at me and says, ah, it's not always this cold. I said, okay, so I got what I can handle. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always this cold. I mean, that's fine. And I just ended up in Michigan. That was, was a great experience. And having Gus, and also my daughter is a freshman in Michigan. She's not a swimmer, but she's also in Michigan. And it's a, it's a great connection. I think um, colleges in the U.S., they have this legacy thing. They have this... This thing that it kind of like involves everybody that's around. I think they, they really praise the, the fact that the families are graduated and alumni from the colleges. And both of them are, are really happy in Michigan and I'm really proud of them. What was, what was the culture like in those days with the consideration of going to live abroad, going to train abroad and be part of swimming or training in the U.S.? What was the appeal for you, Gustavo? Uh, education and training. Uh, as far as to, to be in Brazil and having training at the same level as the education is very complicated. You know, you, you have to go to a big town to have good coaches. Then you have to transportation within the city. We live in Sao Paulo. Now I'm in the country, but uh, I lived in Sao Paulo for for some of the years. And it's like an hour to get to the, to the to the place, an hour to come back and then go to the school. Schools and clubs disconnected. They have no connection uh, to each other. So it's very time consuming. And a lot of people in Brazil, even today, they, they don't go to school because the, the, the sports is so demanding and the transportation and the location and all that is kind of uh, complicated. So in, at Bowles, when I went to high school, that was like, man, this is perfect. I live in the same place I train and study and eat. I mean, mm -hmm. how much better can this be? Mm -hmm. But a legend of Brazil swimming helped you on that journey, didn't she? Excuse me? A legend of Brazil swimming, Maria Lenk. Did she not oh, advise yeah. you? Maria Lenk was a big influence. Uh, when I the decision to go to the U.S. passed by uh, a lot of people, and Maria Lenk, she knew uh, about bowls, and uh, she was like, "You should look into this." Because I talked to many, many different people, and Maria Lenk was like, "I know Greg. I know this place might interest you." And when uh, and there was a couple of Brazilians that had been around there, J.R. De Souza that swam for Tennessee. And then you start looking at the type of people that, that went to bowls and it's like, well, oh, man, look at this program. It's like unbelievable. I had no idea that this even existed and because it's, you had to wait for the swimming world to get to Brazil with six months later than, you know, the issue came out for you to see what was going on. Communication information had, it didn't exist. But yes, Maria Lenke was a big influence. I know. I, I, I know what shipping things to Brazil is like, and it's still the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult. Very difficult. Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, maybe you're some of the inspiration for my swimming career too, because I was born in Jacksonville. Um, oh. Yeah, and uh, I was thought like I never, I didn't grow up there, uh, so I didn't end up swimming for bulls. But you know, it's kind of one of those things that I felt like, oh, maybe my swimming career would have taken the same trajectory even if I stayed there, if I had just gone to bulls and been the part of this, you know, swimming factory. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny to talk about the, the culture changes. I remember, you know, um, 
I remember shepherding uh, Cesar Cielo uh, when when he first came to Auburn and he couldn't speak any English whatsoever. And Mm -hmm. I was uh, taking him to different courses to train or to like practice for the TOEFL, um, which at the time he he came straight there and was trying to learn English, but wasn't, you know, into the school yet and was training with the club team and, you know, going through this culture shock and everything that he would say to me was, okay, Brian. (laughs) <laughs> just, just didn't understand and um you know it's it's uh I, I'm not having lived that i can you know just only appreciate what life is like acclimating to the culture not only uh you know ev- everything about moving to a new country and having new experiences but also then being thrust into an environment that's like a pretty tough training environment i mean you went somewhere where uh, I mean, this wasn't your immediate next step but then to go to michigan where you're training with john legendary for writing these insane uh you know training programs that so many coaches today are emulating with his system it seems like you know the the, the coaching tree and the training tree of of john urbanchek's influence is everywhere now so um what was it like for you gustavo adjusting to uh the training environment um you know in the u.s whether that be starting at bulls and then to um and then to michigan it was a it was a big big shock big difference because when I came to the U.S. I wasn't really used to do double workouts. I was only doing once a day, maybe once or twice. I'll go in the morning, but very uh, very rare to have more than one workout a day. And and when I went to bowls and and with Greg Troy, it's like unbelievable. It's like three times in the morning from five thirty to seven thirty before class, and then you have no time for a nap. You go for the afternoon. It's like I'm gonna die doing this. And, uh, <laughs> And all of a sudden, swimming all the and all I wanted to do is do some sprints. And he's like, "No, no, we're in base now, base workout." And then you have a, a yeah. lot of volume, and then you'll be specific. And now we're gonna swim fast. And then like you swim fast twice a year. I was like, "Come on, man, I want to swim fast more than that." And I remember asking him, "Can we do some sprints?" Like I don't know, maybe it's just like starts. Like what do you mean, like start? Like 20, 25? <laughs> what do you want to do? And for him, sprints was like 30, 50 is on one thirty, as, as fast as you can go. All of them. <laughs> You're killing me. That's why I started swimming 200. But uh, with John and with with uh, Greg, it was two different experiences. Great coaches, different philosophies. But uh, both of them are winners, and both both of them they wanted to do like uh, great results, and and the results that you see in their in their um, their performance over the years uh, were, were great. And John has had a different philosophy, and the team kind of had a lot of uh, autonomy to do things. You had the captain, you had the training, a lot of middle distance swimmers uh, in Michigan. That was a, a big challenge for me because I was a sprinter. I was also, of, of course, a 200 freestyler, but uh, to swim a fast 50 training with John, even with Greg, it was, it was a little difficult. Now I see Caleb Dressel, you know, uh, kicking ass in the 53 swimming with, uh, with Greg and he changed all, all, over the years. I was a fast 50 freestyler. But training for the 200 took a lot of speed, a lot of explosiveness out of that, that event. So that was uh, uh, hard at times because my 100, I had to go hard to go 23.8, 23.6 going out. But I didn't have that explosive. I was fast, but I wasn't explosive. And I think training that was a, a little bit uh, was a little bit missing in both of my training with John and with Greg. But on the other hand, my 200 was, uh, was pretty, pretty good. And uh, all the training and all that experience was uh, kind of mixed together pretty well. Definitely. I mean, I think you hinted on some of the progressions over the last 20, 30 years uh, of swimming training. It's just more specialization, you know, not as much building the base, a little bit less garbage yardage. So, Gus, obviously you have a much different experience right now at Michigan uh, with Mike. We know Mike's a legendary sprint coach. What type of training are you guys currently doing? And when you hear your dad talk about some of the sets and things he did in the past, what are your thoughts on on the relevancy of that? Yeah, I mean, I think 30, 50s on a 130, best average, like that is just insane to even think about um, because my hardest sets looks like, like four times 450s all out. On the, on the minute or something, or a minute and a half or something. So like we're doing a quarter of what he's doing with breaks in between. Um, but I mean, yeah, training has definitely changed a lot. I mean, hearing the amount of yarders that my dad used to do. Um, um, Mike, Mike, even though he's a very sprint oriented coach, we still do a decent amount of yardage on Mondays and Wednesdays. 
Um, and I think that's mostly because we are, we have a lot of guys in the sprint group that also swim two hundreds. Um, but I guess like the bulk of the swimming of, and training that we do um, revolves around a lot of race pace. So we do race pace um, four times a week, pretty much. Or, I mean, we honestly do race pace every single day, but Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays are the big race pace days. So we do a hundred race pace on Tuesdays, USRPT, which is just a bunch of 25s um, on a hundred pace with fifties in between. Um, on Thursday, we usually do, usually do a hundred or 200 race pace. So, and, and he calls that UMA2D. Um, which stands for University of Michigan Aerobic and Anaerobic Development. Um, <laughs> and that's essentially 50s at 100 or 200 pace with um, yardage in between. So I guess like a normal set would be like, we'll do like um, a normal set would be like, okay, you guys have to swim 400. And, but in the 400, um, six of those 50s have to be 200 pace and everything else can be um orange and then you take your four fastest 50s and we'll do an add of 200 so that'll be something we do or we'll do like 50 100 pace three ones i am 50 100 pace two ones long fly with fins on like three or four times or something like that so it's just like hitting the pace and then you do like a lower aerobic in between to keep your heart rate up and then you keep doing that over and over again so those those are usually pretty hard and then friday we do short pull so we do 50 pace essentially so we do a lot of speed and kick and then saturday is your conventional race pace so we'll usually get the pool in competition lane style and do 75s 50s and 25s at race pace like broken up in different ways and mike has a lot of crazy combinations of stuff we do um and then usually we'll end the week with um a relay so like a four free relay four medley relay or like a two or two free or two medley relay Gustavo, do you ever hear him talk about this training? Uh, the the, the, the thing, out. Brian, when, when I hear these things, what he says in the artage that they do, and then he goes in and breaks all the all my records, all the things that I've done in Michigan. I was like, man, how can you do this training 3,000 yards in one workout? I, I, I remember going to Michigan, and then I saw a workout. Maybe they need 1,000. But it was like, <laughs> I, oh, I don't know about that. All, you know, it, it, a lot of weights. Go to the water, swim down a little bit, and do a bunch of hard stuff like as fast as you can go, kick or whatever. And I think that's the biggest difference because with the garbage yardage that you guys mentioned, we did a lot of swimming, a lot of swimming, a lot of swimming. And it's like, oh, you're dying at the end of the the race on the hundred free. Okay, so we need more aerobic. So, <laughs> you don't need more aerobic. You need more anaerobic. I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> Why, why aren't we doing faster stuff? No, fast stuff is, has to be in one specific moment. And now they do fast swim every single week, the, independent. The first week, you're going to do some fast swimming. Yeah. You, swimming, you have to swim fast. You have to swim at the, the highest pace for the longest time at the best performance you can do. That, that's, that's what it is. Especially if you swim in 150 and 100. 200 is a different animal. Yeah. But uh, 50 and 100, you're in, like, in one stage. And 200, 400, it's a, it's a different event and then you know have different combinations but you have to go out at 50 point uh, now in the, in the 200 free yeah you know? and you have to be easy at 50 you know mm -hmm. to come back at 53 54 and it's not it, that's aerobic aerobic alone is not going to do that but at the time when when you were so in the training program that you were doing you're talking about um being able to swim up to the 200 not taking away from some of your 50 speed that totally makes sense when you when you think about um, how that relates to um, the 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 lower, I guess you know the way the training is structured today, um, was that obvious to you at the time that you could have had a better outcome? Were you thinking, hey, I'm not doing what I should be doing to get the best out of myself, or was that were you totally never. bought into the structure of the day? And that was never the because it never because if I had that doubt, I would step against Popov, a, a step against Gary Hall, I would have already lost the race before I even tried. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in what I was doing. And the best, the most conscien conscientious uh, season that I've had in my entire career was the 1996 uh, season. I have recorded every single workout that I did throughout that season, every single one of them, from week one to week, I don't know, I, I think it was like 28 weeks, 32 weeks. Imagine a season with 38 weeks. It's like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And you're going to do one taper during that season. 
It was like uh, from January to July. That, that was my my sequence of, of workouts. And I know exactly what I did. I don't have my logbook here. I have it upstairs. But if I open my logbook on week 12, I will give you exactly the workout I did, the times that I did, and how I felt that day. And when you put all that effort and conscientious uh, on your plan and the things that you're doing, the result is going to come out. I mean, that's the process. That, that's, how you, that's how you win. You don't win at the Olympics and stepping on the blocks. Of, of course, you need mental toughness to do that and confidence and all that. But if you work every single day and you know what you're doing and you believe what you're doing, maybe I did more yardage that, 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 that I needed to do, of course. But at the time, no, this is what I have to do. And Coach, Coach Troy, I was training with Coach Troy in 96. He made sure that, uh, that that was what I needed to do. And I bought yeah. into it because if you don't, you're already lost. <laughs> Is that how you, that's a lot of pressure as well, isn't it? You, you've got all that work behind you. You have that one shot and that, that, that's a lot, you know, for the week here, I guess, that's a lot of pressure. How, how do you deal like if that was a fail? Like I heard you speak to Brett about that. Like you didn't fail. You, as long as you do your best and you are happy, that's, the, that's, that's what you have no regrets. But a lot of people can't handle that after all that work, that one shot on Olympic free and they make one mistake they can't deal that pressure. Give some advice. Maybe what you give your son. Well, life is it's a lot longer than just one Olympic Games, one competition, one event, and one result. Every time you focus 100% of your expectation on one thing, and that's usually the end because that's how you get frustrated. Mm -hmm. You look at the end, uh, the another thing, let's say I want to go to the Olympics. I want to get a medal. So not only you want to go to the Olympics, which is extremely hard, but you also want to get a medal at the Olympics. So it's like it, it potentializes all this expectation. And then you don't get that. Then you get frustrated. And on the process, on how you, how you build the process to get to the Olympic Games, gen if, you, if you're looking at always at the result at the end, generates stress, mm -hmm. gener generates fear, mm -hmm. generates a bunch of like emotions emotions through your body and through your life that's like man if i don't do this today I, i'm not gonna get my medal and then you always focus on the medal we talk i, I had a live with, with gus here and we talked about that focus on the process you have to focus on the process because if you look at the end and you always at the result the result is a consequence of what you're doing today so do it today well but if i don't do it today i'm not gonna get the medal of course you're not but you're not gonna get a medal if you don't focus every single day on the things that you have to do so stop crying, whining about it, and, you know, get your head on the, on the water. Let's do it. And, and that's just an example of um, getting a result in Olympics. And then you train so hard, you pay the price, you sacrifice uh, everything that you have, you know, you study, you don't sleep. And then you go to the competition. Oh, I didn't swim fast. Well, all right, go to the next one. What did you learn from this? Because if you cry about something that didn't happen and then you give up, at that point, the frustration is even higher. And usually when you, it's, a, it's very common when we lose a, a, a game or you lose a competition or you don't do so well in the workouts. And on the next day, you make a decision. You, you And athletes, they have the greatest ability to do that. We have to decide when we're going to feel good. We, mm -hmm. we decide that. That's We're going to feel good when? Mm -hmm. In the competition and in situations, at Big Tens, at the Olympics at the nationals, at the state championship, we have to make that decision. And after you make the decision, okay, I'm going to be good in four months. All right, what do I have to do today? Because I'm going to feel good there. I made a decision. And then when you wake up that day and you don't feel that great, so, I mean, I, I decided that I'm going to be great. So if this is how it's going to be my day, let's do it. Let's go. No, I think some huge points and stuff we've been hearing from more athletes. We're talking with Coleman Stewart, one of the top backstrokers in the U.S. And, you know, he's talking about not really even setting goal times, just going and making sure you have a plan or a goal that day. And he knows if he has his goal accomplished that day in the pool, it's going to come to it at the end. So I think, like you said, thinking more what you can do in the moment, what you're going to be able to do, not just putting too, so much stress on one event. Because like you said, we're, we're more than just Olympic swimmers, gold medalists, those types of things. It's more about the process. And I think, obviously, when we're looking at long-term athletic development and then transitioning from swimming into life, having these lessons is really key because this is going to be applied to a lot of things out of the pool as well. Just being able to, once yeah. again, set daily goals, overcome these daily goals, and then continue to get better. I think, John, sometimes you focus so much on the medal or the team or everything else that you forget that you have to swim first. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And 
if you don't swim well, you're not going to get any of that. So stop worrying about that. Just focus on doing the best you can on the swimming, on, on the game. Focus on the game. But guys, that's really hard to do for a lot of people. I mean, they have money riding on this. They have their or their, their parents pressuring them. The mental depression in sports is not talked about as much as it should be. Um, you know, the suicide rates in swimming is terrible. Uh, like, what do you, how do you make a conscious steps to to help people who are struggling with this, who need to go and party like crazy to feel happiness? You know, it's it's a hard thing in, in our sports. Well, it's a combination of uh, how you're being raised. So the parents have a big uh, a big responsibility on this on this process. How you've been coached how you, the coaches deal with the results. Yeah. And, and that's since young age. You know, the coaches, they have a huge impact on, on, on the kids' results. The personality of each other, we're different. Everybody's different. And um, teammates, how you deal with, with your things, but especially the, this combination, what, what the school that you're in, the pressure, the things that happens there, the responsibilities of the coaches and the parents, and also the personality of the of the athlete. I think the combination of all this is the is what impacts the most. Because then you have to we learn in sports to deal with frustrations. We are taught that, but people are not. I like to win, and when I lose, I'm upset. I cry. So why are you upset? Why are you crying? What's going on? But what do you want to achieve? So where are we going to go with this? And and sometimes what I think it happens, Luke, is. Parents get so involved in the kids' life in sports that they interfere in a wrong way in how they're developed. So the pressure is not just from the, the kid already has a lot of pressure. The young adult always have a, 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 a lot of pressure to do the result and to do something. But um, and then the parents come in and say, "Well, you need to win. Oh, let's go!" And you know that parents, crazy parents on the on the stands, you know, fighting with the judge. You're going to, on the football, you're going on basketball, we're, we're, going, we're talking about swimming. But think about those crazy parents that are interfering and thinking that the life that the kids have is their life. It's not your life. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the kid. Leave them alone. Just support. And I, I saw a great quote the other day, Luke, and that's like this. If you want to help your kids as parents, mm -hmm. act like grandparents when you're cheering for them. That's the best advice I've ever heard for, from anybody. I never really thought that. But when, but when the uh, grandparents in the stand, they're not crazy. They're loving <laughs> their grandkids. They're not crazy. They don't want to win. They want them to be happy. They want to enjoy. They want to do a bunch of different things. Yeah. And the kids relax. I remember. I remember. I was a grandparent to my son. He can speak for himself, but I think I helped in some way. <laughs> I, re I, re I remember my grandmother watching me swim, and she before I swam, she said, "Hey, what color helmet do you wear?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, uh, so, but Gus, did you feel pressure with uh, all the accolades that, and accomplishments from your dad, and having your name attached, and to come into sport as a young swimmer? I mean, do you feel like his advice was echoing in your mind, and you were able to channel out any expectations of being a Borges, or um, what was your experience as as a young swimmer in Brazil trying to make a name for yourself? Yeah, I think my my experience as a young swimmer is very different than the experience I have now. I think my dad probably noticed this better than I did. But when I was young, um, I remember very vividly when I was like 13, 14, 15. So kind of like when swimming starts becoming more serious and you start hitting puberty. Um, I, I remember thinking like, wow, like if I want to be someone in swimming, I have to win at least four Olympic medals because my dad won four Olympic medals. I remember vividly thinking that when I was a teenager. Um, and like, that wasn't easy to think about because like winning four Olympic medals is really hard and no, no 14 year old should have that sort of expectation or judgment looming over him because that's just not going to help that person, that kid be the best that they can be. Um, and I think as I grew, I matured and I definitely had a lot of these hard conversations. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, every, I feel like every, once a year, there would be a moment when I would break down. And I would talk to, to my parents and be like, hey, like I feel pressure because of this. And it might it might be school, it might be, it might be my name, it might be the way someone's treating me at, at the swim pool or whatever. And I think that helped me to grow a lot because I realized that um, and my dad also and my family also helped me realize that I do not need to do anything. Um, 
all, all I really have the opportunity of doing are the things that I want to do. And I, and I realized when I was about 16, 17, that I, I loved swimming and I wanted to keep swimming and I really wanted to see how good I could get. Um, and that's something that's very clear to me now. But when I was younger, like there was, there was pressure. Like I, whenever I met someone and, Oh, you're Gustavo. So like, wow. Like uh, when are you going to go to the Olympics? Oh, don't forget about me when you win an Olympic medal. And all those little comments, like they only get to you if you let them get to you. Um, no one controls your mind. Um, something like that is only going to make you nervous or make you worry if you let that worry you. So that definitely took some time and I've definitely grown a lot um, because of it. So I'm grateful for it. Um, and right now it's a lot better than it used to be, but I'm grateful that it happened because it made me who I, into the person I am today. Hey Gus, I want to change this up a bit. Gustavo, you make me think about the, the grandfather comments and I have two kids and I definitely look like a grandfather on deck, I think sometimes. Um, but Gus, what advice do you have for me as a dad of two kids who are swimming? My brother went mm. to the Olympics. Their godfather was a medalist. Their uncle was a medalist in Olympics. There's pressure in my family as well. What advice would you give me as a father to this 10 year old and seven year old who is swimming? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I really think it's about seeing, getting to know your kids and knowing what, what they want to do, what drives them. Um, and I, because that's what my dad did with me. I remember when I was young, there were moments when I, I either felt pressure with swimming or I wasn't in love, so much in love with the sport for some reason. And my dad would stop me. He was like, Hey, like, you know, you don't have to swim if you don't want to, like, do you, do you want to play basketball? And I used to play basketball. Um, I played soccer too. I was a goalie, but that didn't really, but he would say like, would you rather go play tennis? Would you rather do another sport? He was like, as long as you do a sport and you're active and you're having fun, like that's all that matters to me. And that took a lot of pressure out of me because I realized like, Hey, I don't like, I don't have to, I don't have to swim if I don't want to. And when you start thinking, when you stop thinking about things in terms of I have to do instead of, instead of thinking I have to do something, you think I get to do something. Um, that just makes everything so much easier. So maybe you, you said you have two boys, Luke. Two kids, uh, a boy and a girl, 10 and seven. A boy and a girl. Well, yeah. like for instance, I think I can, I can relate to that because I have a younger sister and she swam until she was 16, 17. And she realized like she doesn't love swimming. Um, she, she loves the sport of swimming, but she didn't love training every day. She didn't, she didn't really, she didn't want to do it in college. And, um, and I did. And, and that's, that doesn't make me or her a better or a worse person because of it. It's just because she had other interests. I mean, she is like, she, she still trains a bunch. She's like, she's in a triathlon team here. She's going to the gym every single day and running and biking. And she still swims with the triathlon team. Um, so she's super active and she's happy and she has all these friends and I'm doing the same thing, but in, in a different way. And I think, and I think it's difficult when your kids are, you said seven and 10, mm -hmm. It's difficult because they're still figuring stuff out. Right. So I would say my advice would be let them just let them do what they think is fun and just guide them towards the world of sport, which is what my dad did. So, I mean, yeah, they can swim, but also like, hey, do they want to do guitar lessons, piano lessons? Put them in that. Do they want to um, also play basketball or soccer or lacrosse or whatever? I think just letting them see what's out there and the main thing being, hey, let's have fun then you can't really go wrong because if you love them and you support them and you, and you allow them to have fun, that's all you can really do as a parent. Does, did your dad ever coach you or does he get on deck at all of you and give you any advice? Get, let me hear some sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, what's how, underwater? How what's he underwater? Yo, what's <laughs> underwater? <laughs> Hip driven. High elbow. <laughs> I love um, that. I, the pool that I showed you guys here, there's a, we have a 17 meter pool yes. at our house. I have a story about that pool too, but you, you, maybe it's the same story, but you go ahead. Go ahead. We'll do that. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So I have us the same view. <laughs> the pool he showed, um, that's our countryside pool, country house pool where we live now. We don't live in the city anymore. And it's a 17 meter, meter pool with one lane. Um, and there's like a little area to like um, a bigger area where you can like um, jump in the water too. Um, but it's just a lane. And actually the tiles in the bottom are, maize and blue so they're michigan color and we've had that we we built that house maybe like 15 years ago i want to say right dad about yeah. and so I, I would swim all week i would train hard 
Um, and then we would get to, we would go to the, the, <laughs> the countryside house in the weekend. And what was the activity? <laughs> we would swim. <laughs> um, but it was, it wasn't, it wasn't like, Hey, we have to swim. It was like, Hey, like, do you want to jump in and like swim a little bit? Like, I can take a look at your stroke, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And I remember my dad had, he had this little camera. I think it was called like a flip camera or something. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And it was like super, super in the, everyone had it like 10 years ago or something. And he would film me with this camera and, and he would always say, all right, we're going to do 20, 17 and a half perfect stroke. That's all we're going to do today. And we're not going to stop until you get 20 and perfect stroke. And I'm like, okay. And sometimes it would take 300 like 50, meter. that's 300 meters. 300 meters. Okay. And, and <laughs> they would take, and the water was not heated. All right. So it was really cold, even though it was warm outside, it was sunny, the water was cold. And sometimes it would take an hour to swim 300 meters because I, and, and, and I think, and, and I, and I heard a quote the other day, which, um, which supports my dad's theory of doing 20, 20, 20, 17 and a half of perfect stroke and not stopping until you hit him. And it goes something like, um, like great athletes will keep doing something until they get it once, or like until they get a great stroke or technique once, but exceptional athletes, the greatest athletes of all time, they'll keep doing it until they can't get it wrong. And I think that I think about that a lot because if I, if I had gone to that pool and I did 2017s and the last three were great stroke, I could have done 17 more at, at that great stroke and I could have gotten even better. That would have, I mean, John can probably talk more about like the neuromuscular patterns and all this stuff in our brain to our body. But like Bruce Lee says, I don't fear the man who knows 10,000 kicks. I fear the man who's done one kick 10,000 times. So I think that philosophy that my dad instilled with me, like I actually think one of the greatest tips my dad has ever given me was whenever you warm down, don't do it in a shit stroke. And the reason that's so important is because when you're tired, when you're super, super tired, and you're warming down and you're swimming in a really bad stroke like that your brain is still going to capture that it's still going to get engraved in your memory which is why i always either do backstroke easy or i do perfect hip driven stroke when i warm down um but yeah that's the story of the pool in the backyard the cold pool yeah, but, but is, just to add a little bit to the story i we used to come on friday night and he skip the saturday workout so that was an exchange <laughs> so, so he either do like a 4,000, he was like 12, 13 years old, and he was so uncoordinated. So I'll watch his workouts, and I was like, come on, look at that stroke. And he won't make any intervals, and he'll soon fly, like, you know, his fly was like, like <laughs> he was so tall at 12, 13, and so uncoordinated. It looked like uh, uncoordinated, because he was like, swimming more, he couldn't keep up, I mean, he was... Caio Pumputz was his, uh, was his uh, uh, teammate. He swims for Georgia Tech. He's one of the best swimmers in the NCAA today. So he, he would have to keep up with these guys, and he didn't keep up with these guys. So we do the same intervals. And so like, it was crazy. And I'll, for him to rest, would come a day earlier to our, our hometown, our, home, our country uh, house, which is good for the family also, of course, coming on a Friday night instead of a Saturday. And we would do 20, 17, or even 10 lanes. Count your strokes, and that was easy. It was nothing hard, but the best stroke you can do, and then you get out, and then you go do your things. And that <laughs> was better than swimming 4,000 meters, doing everything wrong. All the strokes are all over the place. No, do like this, high elbow, got long arms, got the high elbow, and let's go. Yeah, I think some huge points here, obviously. Gus, very nice, neuromuscular um, education. It's got to be dialed in. And one of the most common phrases was after – um, the 10,000 hour rule and the thought mm. time, oh, you just do 10,000 hours of something that makes you an expert. But even the creator of this theory later changed it where it's not just hours of it. It's deliberate practice. It's perfect mm -hmm. practice with it because just doing something like crap, including warm down, isn't going to get you there. So we've all been around swimming for, for tons of years, all of us collectively. In swimming, do we still think, and Gustavo, I'll start with you, do you still think there's too much garbage yardage? I mean, you do a lot of stroke technique and also learn to swim work in Brazil. What type of things are you trying to instill in those young kids? And like I said, do you think we're still doing too much garbage yardage? Uh, I couldn't answer you that because I think different coaches, different philosophies have uh, different ways of getting to, to the results. So it's kind mm -hmm. of hard to say 
in general, if people are doing more garbage yardage now than they were doing, I, I suppose, I assume they're doing less in general. And just like my generation did less than the one before, because uh, Ricardo Prado here in Brazil, he'll do 20K uh, days, like all week. He'll do 10,000 workouts, 9,000 workouts, every single workout for, you know, he trained with Mark Schubert for a long time. So and when you when you talk about the ten thousand and development of talent, you probably read the book Talent Code and talks about uh, the way that you can develop uh, your your ability by challenging yourself by working repeatedly on the right direction, the practice, mastering coach, and all the elements that you brought in here. So if you have that, uh, the garbage yard is if you have a bad stroke when you're doing it, it's horrible for you. The garbage yardage, if you have a perfect technique, maybe it takes you to another level. But then it depends on what, the, what you're looking for. Now, for example, right now I'm telling, uh, talking to Gus. For me, I used to, in, when I'm, I was doing the tapering, I, I used to like long swims, very easy, just technique. You know, 2100 on taper, just, that's, what, that's a workout. And I've seen many sprinters just doing like continuous swimming very slow because you have to swim slow to swim fast. And most sprinters, they can't, they have the ability to swim slow and then they have the ability to switch and, and be fast. So anytime you're doing perfect technique, I think you're, you're in the right, uh, in your right position. But when you, we talk about garbage yardage, we're talking about very heavy that brings your, your, maybe your technique down and then you're not in a position to do anything good with it. My opinion. So with garbage yardage and, and technique, like you said, great sprinters can often swim slow very well. I would argue with different speeds, your biomechanics change so much. So Perfect. do we really think this is working on technique when you're going slow and, and focusing on these things? This actually translates to sprint technique or that it's more psychological and that it's actually just, like you said, mentally getting you in that preparation for translating into perfect sprint biomechanics? I think both. You can have a physiology effect by swimming more and having an aerobic capacity that's going to increase by just swimming. And you can have the technical side of it because when you put a lot of legs, a lot of uh, you know back, uh, back proportion on your stroke, it's different when you're going slow and when you're going very fast. But the position that your arm goes in, how it comes out, for me, when I when I used to swim slow or fast, it's almost the same technique. What changes is the tempo, how fast your, your stroke is going. But the technique, how it goes into the water, how it comes out, and then you just, uh, with, with your legs in it, it makes a difference. But, you know, I'm not a coach, but it's just, it's just uh, and the athletes, they have to have a, a huge capacity to to feel the body you need to feel the body you need to feel you have to have a, 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 the conscientious of, of of your hands of your body of your of your entire uh, on the on the water that's the most important thing maybe you don't need to do five thousand six thousand to feel that and to have the, the ability to do it maybe with two thousand three thousand you can have the same thing i used to go 134 and the 203 short course yards swimming 70k a week with john Gustavo here, when they, they do 40K, he's like, whoa, man, we're doing a lot. <laughs> um, you know, we're 450s all out. They used to do, you know, 30. And it's a completely different story. They're doing different different situations outside the water. Uh, Mindset is completely different. Everything is different. And I think the, especially the workout. Gustavo, you were uh, ice ram in your tank. Um and you were one of the, the you and Alex pop off were one of the inspirations for stroke. Um, and I always thought that, okay, I didn't have the height. Like Gustavo is fast because he's 12, 10 inches taller than me. Um, I, we actually raced against each other once in, in, a, in a Grand Prix meet, like in prelims. You definitely remember that, of course. Um, <laughs> but I, I, all, all, all I can remember was just how big and strong, but also more than that, how graceful you were in the water. And so I did everything to get, I didn't have the height, but everything gets stronger everything to get my technique perfect. But in my latter years, I realized that the one of the difference was I wasn't strong, as strong here and here. I didn't work as hard as I could have at the time, and I wasn't as strong up here. And that was a big difference. Gus, you have almost your father's height, a couple inches shorter. You have your father's mindset, work ethic, um, brains. Like, like what makes you faster? You just broke his records, dude. 
smarter than me. You've got better, bigger, better brains than me. There we go. <laughs> what sets you apart, dude? I'm only half an inch shorter than the old man, but <laughs> um, I don't know. I think, I think, I mean, I am, I am faster in terms of like my time right now and his time when he swam. Um, but I think this concept of being faster compared to t- people from different times oh, for sure. isn't necessarily, but that's more of a philosophical yeah, um, yeah. approach to it. But um, I would say, I mean, the difference is definitely the training, um, yeah. the things that we do. Um, I don't know if necessarily I have a, a stronger um, mind than my, than my dad did at when he was my age. It, it's probably different in some ways. Um, we're, we're, di- I think we're very similar people. Um, but we're also different in terms of, I mean, my dad has rubbed off a lot on me. Um, like you said, like growing up, um, just, I mean, the, the things that he has, he has said here today, he's been saying them for like, since I was like, I remember, um, but mostly since, um, I could really begin to understand what he meant when he was saying those things. Um, but I guess, I mean, speaking on the question you asked, like, why do I think that I'm faster than him in the 50 and hundred? And I think I'm a 10th slower than you in the 200, right? Yeah. Like a 10th. Okay. Um, and, and like you said, I got, that's what? Well, well it, it's not, it's not why you're faster. What sets you apart? Like, I mean, like, do I have to be as work hard as Gustavo did? Do I have to be as mentally tough as you did? Mm. Or, you know, like, like what, 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 what made you as fast? You didn't ha- you don't have to mm-hmm. be, I don't have to be six foot eight. I yeah. mean, we, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, I think it definitely has to do with the way you look at swimming. Um, the perspective you have, um, your, your relationship with the sport, the things that go through your head when you're looking down at like black tiles for 17 to 20 hours a week, like the thing, like the, the person, the little voice in your head is like, mm-hmm. I think that's what you're referring to Luke. Like that's yes. definitely a huge, yes. a huge factor yes. in how you perform. And um, just like the, the amount of purpose that you have, like I, I have no doubt in my mind that my dad would go into each of his practices with purpose just like the greatest swimmers of all times do. Um, and that is not something that I, that I have always done. Um, that's definitely something that I have developed um, thanks to my dad and thanks to other people that I've talked to and things that I have learned. Um, and, I think, and I think that's at the end of the day, what sets apart the people, like you can have someone that can go really, really fast in practice and maybe it doesn't come together um, at the meet or when it counts, like at, at the big meet, and I think it's because of what's, what's in here. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I think that we can all agree here that at the level that we're at, like Luke, you might've said that maybe you didn't work as hard as you could have, but you were, work, you were probably working really, really hard. Mm-hmm. You're probably still working really hard. And, and at the level that, um, we have all swum at NCAA, like, um, mm-hmm. the international level, everyone's working really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Like the, the difference in, in effort and training that the number one and number 20 guy is doing, it's probably not huge. Um, it's probably very minimal, especially to someone that doesn't really understand swimming. So I think the biggest difference is like in, in our minds and the way we look at swimming. And like I said, like the purpose day in, day out. And there's a lot to go off of that, but short, short answer is um, the mind. Mike Bottom is definitely your coach. Um, but and yeah. if I wanted to be fast, if you want to be faster than Gustavo Borges, just wear a jammer and a swim cap and you're fine. And do a track start because you never wore a cap, <laughs> did you? <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think you did, right? You wore caps at meets. Right? I didn't see you wear a cap in Atlanta or... Me? Boston. Yeah. Yeah. There was, a, there was a post, I think, with swim cats that they mentioned something. That they asked. And I think that I, I, I didn't have like a really that much of a plan. I think I wear a cap up to 95 Pan Ams. I wear a cap that that, that, that that year. From 96 on, I didn't wear any more a cap. Uh, and in long, in long course, long course uh, competitions, I don't even know. I think 96 on, I didn't wear a cap. And I the reason I didn't wear a cap is because Matt Biondi didn't wear a cap. Yeah. Like, and the cap was like hard to put it in. It's like oh, it's like a pain ass. <laughs> it's like you know. And then people start wearing two caps. I said, like, "Dude, one cap just like kills me. I'm gonna put two. It's like press my head. Just cut my hair real short. Put the the goggles, and that's not what's gonna make a difference between gold and bronze or finals. <laughs> or yeah. uh, let's just go. 
And okay. if it works for Biondi, it works for me. And then Pop Pop didn't wear a cap either, so that helped. Yeah. So and then you have Peter Van der Hogenbund growing up and you know having wearing cap. Gary Hall was wearing a cap, and then people started you know everybody wear Michael Michael Phelps, and then everybody. And I, I don't think there's anybody that doesn't wear a cap these days, is there? Maybe no, one. Pretty, you know, huh? pretty pretty rare to go with the shaved head. There's there's Santos, Santos. Santos. Lazo Chat maybe. Yeah, uh, Grant Hayden. Yeah. yeah. Friday, wow. Yeah, then the yeah. ball bags. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Gustavo, you were. Did you guys shave though? Like shaving your body was still a thing in that era, right? Of course. <laughs> that era. Shave <laughs> my body. You have to good. Good thing in my house. <laughs> TMI. <laughs> still. Yeah, that always confused me though with the no cap though. Is why you shave your whole body, but you don't shave your head. Yeah, well. Hey, so, yes. it's, a, it's a matter of sur surface. You didn't yeah. shave your armpits at 96, though. Here. Right? You didn't shave your armpits at 96, right? Yeah, because I thought I was going to go to the finals. <laughs> 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 I swear I was going to go to the finals. I'm, not, I'm just going to shave in the finals. That's that's what happens. <laughs> I was kind of, because every time I shave my armpits, it really hurts like the next couple of days. It's like ingrown hairs and stuff. I was like, I was getting old then, so I was like, man, it's not going to make a difference right here. Let's just do it. <laughs> I want to talk about 96 for a second because um, I heard you say the 100 free finals was one of your favorite races you did. And, and for me, for sure, that was an epic race to see the three of you charging down, you know, stroke for stroke that last 10 meters. But my favorite race of yours, Gustavo, was your 200 in that. Um, you're outside, almost outside smoke. Um, I remember like, seeing Daniel Loder in 95 Pan Packs and learn about Daniel Loder at that point. And so it wasn't a huge surprise to see Daniel coming back, but I was so convinced that you were charging down that outside lane. You went out, what, 53 low, um, and you're coming home on the whole field. Like, you were nowhere at 150. And to me, that was your favorite race. Do you, what do you think about that 200 free? Why did Daniel, like, what happened in that race um, that, that, I mean, I don't know. Talk us through that race, that 200 free. And then Gus, I want to hear your perspective. What, do you think that was like, Crazy race or not? Yeah. Who wants who do you want first? Me? Yeah, you talk about that that the 200 free. What you went yeah, up yeah. like four. Yeah. I, I was I was looking into the 200 free since the year before. Yeah. I remember 90. Let's start 92 real quick. I, I swam in the morning, had the shittiest race of my life. I was uh, I didn't sleep well, went out fast. I was uh with uh, Eugenie Sadovi at the prelims. Yeah, Olympic champion, and I think it was in lane three, he was in four. I was like a very well ranked going into the Olympics in 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was another Brazilian, Michelena, on lane two. And I went, I was so zero confidence. So when you're zero confidence, what do you do? You just go out hard, you just you, you, you do as fast as you can, you die in the end, and then you come out of the water and say, at least I tried. That's <laughs> usually what people that fail do. Right? That's, that's how we do. And that's what I did. And uh, I went out, I was half a body ahead of Eugenie Sadov in the first 50. I was together with him in the 100. 150, I was half a body, and then I was like four seconds behind him in the prelims. And as I was watching the, the, the finals that day, uh, near, I don't remember if it was John or, or Greg, I think it was Greg. It's more like a, a Greg Choi's comment. John, I don't think, would say such, so, such straightforward like that in my face. He goes, Gus, did you like the race? 200 free. Eugenie just won the 200 free. I said, yeah, I loved it. The Olympics, you know, this is great. Okay, so you watch this year. Next, you go and you win this medal. You win this race. And and, and that's like four years later that he's talking about. It's like, I'm watching. I'm 19 years old. But okay, let's make a plan here. Four years you do, you know, you do your thing. And that was incredible because four years later, in 95, I had the Pan Ams. I was really, I went 148 for the first time. I was swimming fast. I was winning in situa so I was very confident in the 200. And nobody in the world was swimming under 148. Nobody. So it was like maybe from 92 to 96, um, you know, you had Anders Holmerts, you had a bunch of people. Josh Davis was around. Okay. Uh, Daniel Loder had a, a great swim in, in 92, very young. And then he was, you know, he was the one swimming very fast consistently, not in the 205, which was metal, but uh, in the two and the 403. And then he started that year, he was swimming fast every single race and everybody was together. So the, the, the thing was be in the final 
And when you're in the final, get the medal because everybody's – that's not going to be one guy or going 146. Now, nobody's going to go 146. And 147 is going to get the gold. We knew that. And I trained to go 147. I just didn't go 147. I went 148 or 08. And then in the prelims, I was uh, I had that thing in 92 that I didn't sleep well and I wasn't feeling good. And I slept okay in 96 and I went to prelims and so I wasn't very confident. And I went out the same split that I did in the afternoon. But when I flipped it 150, I was so tired. Mm. And I, I, I went 149 flat, if I recall, and I was seventh. And 149.05 was two other swimmers. Was, uh, I think it was Paul Palmer, and it was the, the Finnish guy. I forgot his name. Uh, Yanni Sivin. Uh, yeah, the Ayama. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the Ayama. So they tied for eighth, and then they swim again, and both of, both of them go 148.68. <laughs> tied again. And then Yanni says, I'm not swimming another one. Paul Palmer, <laughs> you know? So if this guy is going 148 in the morning, I'm out of the final. So yeah. I wouldn't even be in the final. And then I said, wow. And I was so tired. My legs were shaking after the 200 free. I swam down as much as I could. I was like, God, I can't believe this. Then I went. I said, all I have to do this afternoon is to rest. Mm -hmm. And if I rest, I'm going to be fine tonight. And I, I was fine because I was in lane one. And I was going to be breathing towards the crowd. And I wasn't going to see the field uh, during the, the the last 50, which is like very crucial. And I think for me, that was, for the 200, which is like an off event for me at, at times, especially long course with the experiences that I've had. And uh, and I went in and uh, after I flipped the, the 100 free, the 100, I was feeling very, very good. After I, I went on the turn to the 150 and everybody was together, I said, and I think right next to me was Hussolino. Hussolino was, he wasn't very fast out so he was very behind and then i just after i flipped the 150 in fifth place or something like that i had maybe the second fastest last 50. oh your legs and your legs got going man. i had so much left i had so much left and i just went and i think kowalski had the fastest split but I, he I, he was uh i think he was even behind no yeah huh? hey, no surprise of kowalski for sure yeah he was a 400 freestyle miler so he went very fast in the last 50. Daniel Loader had a strategy to go the, the third 50 to go all out. So he spread the 100 to 150. He died at the end, but he had such a lead that he, he didn't lose. And Homerts, which, which is multiple medalist, Josh Davis was in that final, Peter van der Hogenbaum, that's in, that's so, so many so many great swimmers at that, at that race, but we knew that was up for grabs. A, a beautiful, Gus, what was your dad's most beautiful race you saw? To me, that was, that was mine. What was your dad's? Um, personally, I think the four free relay in 2000, yeah. um, there's just something about the four free relay, especially for us, us sprinters, because we, it's like you come together with four guys come together juntos. And, yeah, todos juntos. Juntos. Todos yeah. Juntos. and it's, it's my favorite race, um, of all times, um, at any meet, I think it's just such a fun race and just the amount of like happiness and energy that I could see. I mean, when you watch the video um, and, and the, the Brazil guys on the, um, the podium uh, mm -hmm. before free really in the Sydney Olympics, you can just see they, they look happier than the gold and silver medal guys. I was you know? there, dude. I saw it live. I was, I was on, I was on there and it stands. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. And, I was so happy. To go then. Yeah. And I think that's, they were so happy because they had worked really hard for that. And, they got it together and they had gone like the, the odds were not in their favor. Well, I mean, there was one team that DQ'd and right um, in the morning, um, which helped them um, in winning that medal. But you. the guy that uh, yeah. uh, Peter van der Hogenbahn, I forgot his name. He was anchoring and he jumped. We're lucky. The, yeah, so it's gonna be hard that's to my favorite race. You know, so, so not the worlds in Copacabana Beach at the pool built on the beach when he won. That that must have been a moment. Did you see that race? I haven't seen that race. No, I haven't seen I've that. Seen, I've about I, I don't I've seen that parts of it in the world record. I don't film. Oh, come on. Yeah, that was a. That was All right. A, were, you there? were you there? Look. No, no, but my friends were there because Trinidad sent a contingent and they told me all about it. It was and how <laughs> crazy the crowd was on the beach. But the Gus, what is? What's your dad's greatest achievement? Mm, that's a good question. 
I don't know. He has so many. <laughs> um, Besides having great kids. Well, while you think about it, Gustavo, what's your greatest achievement? My greatest Me? achievement? Yeah, what's Gustavo's greatest achievement? And Gus, what is what do you think your dad's greatest achievement is? No, I'm confused. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. like, like, for instance, Gus, I think one of your dad's greatest achievement is obviously having children, because I'm a dad, right? And that's mm -hmm. how can you not say that? Uh, sure. But you're also teaching 200,000 children to swim. That's also... But what do you think, Gus? Like, of your dad, what's the greatest thing your dad has done in his 48 years? Yeah. On the I think his greatest achievement is the way he lives life, the way he walks around living. Um, I have the pleasure of knowing my dad very, very well. Um, but even when I meet people that talk to me about my dad, they always say such great things. And I think that's not the case for, for like everyone. Like, I think the way my dad looks at life, the way he treats people, like if you go up to my dad and you're like, hey, like I'm a huge fan of yours. Like he'll look you in your eye and be like, hey, like that's awesome. Like do you want to take a picture with me or do you want an autograph or whatever? And that's more common in like the swimming world and when we're in Brazil. Um, but like I can I can easily say that my dad's my hero and, and it's not because of the things he has achieved or the accolades he has, but just because of like his work ethic, his personality. Um, the person he is, like you can tell a lot about someone by the way they treat other people or by the way um, that they carry a conversation. So I think his outlook on life and he he's just always striving to to do good. So like to, like you said, like the way the things that he does with his company with um, swimming or what he's doing more now with his social media um, and his um, um, like the coaching and um the talks he has been doing it's all about helping other people be better helping other people reach fulfillment or be a better athlete so i think that's something that's very gracious and um i admire him for that very good <laughs> thank you <laughs> you're welcome um a, a, a quick turn to you gus because uh, and you got big tens you went 19 over last year and nc's got cancelled um, you know, you have Olympic year. What's going on with you? Um, how are you, how are you feeling for, for Big Tens? And how are you feeling feel, for this year? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I had that conversation with my dad two days ago, and um, Mike always comes up to me. He's like, hey, how are you feeling? Like, what, whatever. And um, I'm really excited. I think um, the, the, the main feeling is just um, about gratitude for the opportunities that we have. Um, and so, um, when we had that opportunity of NCAAs taken away from us last year, and for instance, we had the opportunity of having a midseason taken from us this year um, because um, of COVID, and we also didn't have the opportunity to have our Ohio State meet. Um, so, like, I don't see the, those things as bad, as bad things anymore. I just see the things that I do have as opportunities. And I'm grateful for them. So it's just like I'm just excited to race. I'm just excited to be there with the guys and and do my best for Michigan and do our best for Michigan. So I'm just I'm excited. I, I, are you going to get Paul Powers' record? 1880. That's a really fast record. Um, I am not. I'm not thinking about it in terms of like chasing a record or going a certain time. Um, I think kind of similar to Coleman Stewart in that way. I've kind of changed my outlook on on goals and goal times. Um, I prefer to look at it as me doing the absolute best best that I can in a certain moment. Um, doesn't matter what's going on externally. Um, so yeah, if it happens, that that would be awesome. Um, that that would be an incredible swim. Um, but but me being me having an incredible result is not con contingent on a record or a certain time. Um, so I mean, we'll see if it happens. I mean, there's definitely a possibility, but no easy task for sure. All right, guys, we're gonna finish with a few rapid fire questions, and we'll go back and forth. Sounds good. Gustavo, what is the hardest race in swimming? Two hundred free. Gus, what's the hardest race in swimming? Uh, I think 100 feet long course. Gustavo, Olympic gold or world record? That's an easy one. Olympic gold, always. Olympic gold. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gus, Gus, what's one thing from your dad's era that was innovative at the time, but today has changed dramatically? I elbow. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I guess the the high elbow in relation to sprinting because the high elbow had driven like that beautiful Popov Gustavo stroke 
Um, definitely is very useful still for like a 400, <laughs> maybe, sure. maybe even a 200, maybe, um, but definitely not for, for sprinting, even though Popov was able to go like 21 something with it. I think it's just the, the swimming is just different now, especially with the work Mike has done with, with shoulder driven. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, Gustavo, I wonder if that's the thing for you. What's, what's one innovation today that's so obvious that you wish was, was the thinking in your era that you would have employed? The innovation training. Yeah. Or training or stroke technique, whatever. What's one thing that is, you know, happening in swimming okay. today? I think, that shoulder -driven, I think the shoulder driven is pretty interesting, but I think uh, swimming at race pace more often and constantly throughout the season made a huge difference in sports. And if you go outside the water, the, the weight training, and how you deal with your body also changes a lot. We are very traditional weightlifters. Just go in, you know, isolate the body, body and go. And uh, that's it. If, if you have, you know, strong muscles, you're fine. And then you swim a lot and then you just like fit and eat a lot, swim a lot, work a lot. And that's it. Then I think it's more specialized. But I think swimming at race pace more often, it's, uh, it, it's a completely game changer. Mm -hmm. Gus, what's one thing, it doesn't have to be outcome based, but what's, what's one thing, one feeling, one moment that you want to get out of swimming that has maybe eluded you thus far, or you're still looking for it? That's a good question. Um, definitely. I, I like to think of swimming as at least to me, like, like a mount, mountain peak, um, like the highest point of a mountain. And I think that I, I, I haven't reached that yet. And, and that's what like gets me up in the morning, doing what I can in the moment to get closer to that, um, like the, my best self. So it's really like an idea of fulfilling, fulfilling how fast I can get from point A to point B, to put it simply. Um, just like at the end of the day, I'm just moving my body through water. And I guess being able to do that as fast as I can and just reaching my potential is really exciting. Gustavo, what is the most impactful advice you ever received and who gave it to you? Uh, the most impact, uh, I think was uh, Greg Troy. It's a phrase that uh, I think it was created 400, 500 before Christ. Tony Robbins has used a version of it and Greg Troy, I think, had his own. He said, if you always do what you've always done, you always be what you've always been. So do things differently, get results differently. Gus, same question for you. What's the most impactful advice you ever received and who gave it? Wow. I, I do not have a quick answer to that. So I'll just give you something that I do think about. Um, and that would be, I guess, similar to what my dad says, Mike's version of it is make changes. You got, you got to change stuff constantly. And that's something that like every single year, I'm amazed by how many changes I make, even though like I have improved significantly in the past, like five years, for example. And I think a large part of that is due to Mike constantly um, reminding me to make changes and Mike constantly being like, hey, like, how can we do this differently? Whatever, like, it doesn't matter that I'm a senior. It doesn't matter that I go 19-0. I, I still have to make changes. I still need to find ways to keep moving forward and keep getting better. And that's also John Urbantrick's philosophy, um, the keep moving forward. And Mike's kind of like carried that on. So I, I think that might even be a trait of great coaches and great athletes. Just like you're never satisfied um, with how much you know, and you always know that you can that you can be better. You always know that you can learn more. And, and that's been particularly challenging because sometimes your ego doesn't let you do that. Um, and, and, and for example, to give a quick story, um, like I learned from the guys on my team, the freshmen, sophomores, even though they I might be faster than them, um, I, I still make an effort to be like, hey, like this guy's pull pattern is better than mine, and I go and I and I try to learn from them, and I think I think that's good advice for anyone because it's not always easy um, to be a student and be a learner. Um, sometimes your ego doesn't let you do that, but um, finding a way to get better is huge. Yeah, that's beautiful, guys. Thanks so much for what you're doing for the sport both globally and um, for being an example of how to have a proper parent-child relationship. It's a great example for, for a lot of people. Um, and yeah, we're, we're honored to have this conversation with you today. So thanks for doing it. Yeah. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. it was right fun. On.
That's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Social Kick Podcast. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick, and you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.